you. So I'm really excited and honored to be here today. Um, I'm very new here. I've been at San Diego State for about a month. Um, so two caveats about this talk. I'm not really going to be talking about teaching at San Diego State because I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet, um, but that I hope to be able to partner with faculty and their students. Um, and also, um, this is a very, very condensed version of a very long talk that I gave about a year ago in Kansas. Um, and so it's gonna be really lightning fast and superficial, but the longer version is online, and if you're interested, you can email me, um, and I can send you the YouTube link um, once all these, once the internets are back <laughs> and running completely. Luckily, I don't need, to, I don't need that for today. So um, I borrow for the title of my talk from Matthew Kirschenbaum's What is Digital Humanities and What's It Doing um, in English Departments, um, which is one of many attempts or um, efforts to define digital humanities, um, both within the field and beyond the field. But I'm gonna actually step back from that and, um, and say that I don't want to spend any time defining digital humanities, not just because we've been talking about it all day, but because doing it in class can be um, troubling. So Ryan Cordell, who's at Northeastern, argues that defining digital humanities is an act of exclusion um, for our students, for ourselves. So if we are defining it, we're, we're drawing a boundary and we're saying this is in, this is out, and that's um, counterproductive. Moreover, um, we often focus on the digital, and less so on the humanities, and assume that the humanities is this self-evident signifier that our students understand, and that, in fact, we all agree on what the humanities are. And even today, we've heard, you know, what, do, where the arts fit into this. Is it arts and humanities, or should arts be included in the humanities? So we don't want to do that either. And also, often, it leads to assumptions that our students are digital natives. So while it's true that most of our students grew up immersed in digital technology, though not all of our students have have been. Um, we can't assume that they have a comfort level or an acceptance with those digital technologies. And I think hearing today from, from our students across these different universities, we hear we heard stories of that, a lack of comfort with it, um, wanting to be a Luddite, wanting to not participate in digital technology, and that's fine. So we want to acknowledge that as well, acknowledge that our students come from a range of experiences across the digital divide. So what I want to focus on is a, my own sort of growth across a pedagogic spectrum from digitally inflected work to digitally centered teaching. Uh, while I'm going to be presenting this as sort of a linear progression, I'm not trying to suggest a linear progression. It's just that um, it's kind of the way my brain works. And it happened to hap this happened to be the chronology of how I evolved as a teacher. And I should add that these examples are coming from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I helped start a digital humanities lab in our American Studies Department, which grew to support a campus-wide Mellon-funded digital humanities effort um, that involved students, faculty, postdocs. Um, most of the classes that I taught, I, were, I was actually co-teaching with a faculty member. He was the instructor of record. I uh, started out as his TA, became the project manager in these classes, became the co-teacher, um, but didn't get any credit or overload for that work. So there's an issue there. So to start, um, this was a, an undergraduate class that we taught several times where it was really digitally inflected. We gave students digital inputs, digital, digitized primary sources, and we asked them to make arguments from those sources and produce digital outputs, um, blog posts using WordPress, as so many others of you are using, um, but also trying to do some spatial analysis and some low-tech visualization. So nothing particularly fancy. Um, this was sort of low-tech using Google Earth and taking screenshots. Um, but we were trying to use the digital to teach the, act, the art of primary source research, how to make an argument, how to make a public argument. So we made all of these sites public. At the same time, we were teaching graduate classes, using them as a test bed for um, a data visualization toolkit that we were developing. Um, and so what I was doing was going out into the community, finding partners, and prepackaging projects to give to our students. So I would write like a one or two page project scope, hand that over to a group of students, connect them to the community member. They would work with that partner to try to launch a project in about 14 to 15 weeks. Um, and um, it was challenging because we did this three times and the tools were never robust. They were never completed. They were never debugged. 
Um, the last time we taught this class, we restarted the, the tool in WordPress. And um, literally, we were building it week by week. So I'd come into class, show what we'd built the last week. We'd break it. I'd report back. I'd come back the next week. We'd break it again. And then we'd get it fixed. And so we sort of incrementally tried to make these projects with an incomplete tool. And um, a lot of students had um, expressed a lot of anxiety about the ambiguity of not knowing whether the tool would be ready in time, not understanding what the tool could do. I didn't even fully understand what the tool could do, and I was its project manager, um, and not knowing if we could actually pull it off. And so we learned the hard way that what we needed to do was really scaffold the work that we were doing. So at the same time, I finally did get the opportunity to teach my own course um, at a nearby UNC system school. It was a, it was a uh, master's um, public history program, and they wanted to try to create a digital history track in this program. So I taught the first digital history, public history class there. And I asked the students, rather than give them a project, um, because I didn't really know that community, I asked them to define a project and traverse a really rapid project life cycle and um, launch that project in that semester. And to do this, I finally, having learned from just sort of letting students loose into the wild west of the digital, to scaffold it um, week by week, progressing them through the project. So they have to define the topic, they have to define their audiences, they have to pick a tool based on the tools we were studying in class and assessing in class. Um, what their intended outcomes would be. And then that took them all the way through assessment, both um, assessment of the project and assessment of themselves and sort of how they might have done it better. And I really tried to emphasize the process more than that product because my students had a range of technical skills and comfort with technology. Some decided they wanted to teach themselves to code and did so, and others ran away screaming from the code and just wanted it as easy as possible and wanted to give up as much as they could, as quickly as they could. There were a lot of challenges here. Because I was an adjunct instructor, I didn't have access to IT support. I had no server space. I didn't have a sysadmin. I had to do it all myself. And I made the decision to do that and struggle in front of my students and alongside of them. I wanted them to see me fail. I wanted them to see me hit a wall and then persist and figure out how to get around that wall. Because I wanted to teach them more than anything that when you hit a wall, you can't stop. You have to find a way over or around or you have to dismantle the wall somehow. So I made that conscious decision. But as a result, I bought two years of server space, and I promised them two years of support, and then I pulled the plug. So now one of the eight projects still exists, which is actually more than I was expecting, because this is several years ago. But still, it, there's persistence problems. These students use these to get their first jobs, but now those, if they want to go on to their next job, they don't have this to rely on anymore. Finally, and most challenging, was a practicum, a graduate practicum in digital humanities that we created in support of a new graduate certificate in digital humanities at UNC, which was part of this Mellon-funded initiative. Um, so students would take a traditional graduate seminar in our lab for three credits, and then uh, they would meet, you know, three hours a week, and then they would work for eight hours a week in our lab. And we had anywhere from four to, ten, uh, to nine students in a semester. So if you think about the math, and I hate math. I'm scared of math. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of staff hours that I had to oversee for no additional um, compensation. Um, and I, I make that point purposefully because I want to address some of the ethics of doing this kind of work at the end of this talk. But I had to manage. I had to make sure there was enough meaningful project work for each of my students for eight hours each week of the semester. And this, we did this class, um, we co-taught this class three times. So it was incredibly um, exhausting. And I was not successful in finding meaningful work for all of my students every week. And there was a very uneven experience among the students. I tried increasingly to build accountability uh, to each other and to themselves and to me to make sure that students weren't falling behind, to try to make sure there was some consistency in the project work they were doing. So um, the second time we taught it, we plopped every student into the same project that was about six weeks away from launching as part of a virtual exhibit in our State Museum of History. Um, and so all of the students were working on one project together to help launch it, and then I let them off into different projects at different phases. But the problem was that the project life cycle didn't match the semester um, life cycle, and so I couldn't guarantee a good experience for all of the students. 
So that leads me to some reflections, some challenges, some lessons learned, some ethical concerns, and some, I don't want to suggest better practices, but better practices, um, or, yeah, I think I said that right. <laughs> okay, so um, a lot of these challenges we've already heard takes a lot more time to teach a digitally inflected or digitally centered class, and sometimes we don't have support. Um, sometimes we don't have an infrastructure because we're either adjuncting or our institution doesn't have that infrastructure. And one of the things that I want to do at, um, as the digital humanities librarian is try to figure out what that infrastructure is for faculty to help them navigate through this to make that easier, to reduce the amount of time it takes to start a project in a class. But moreover, if you can partner with, say, your library or your IT to support the project, how long does that project persist? Does it just last through the end of the semester? What if you want your students to take this with them as a portfolio to help them when they leave the, your institution? What's the commitment to supporting that? So, and how can we as, um, well, I'll speak to the librarians in the room, how can we as librarians support that in a way that um, uh, doesn't break our capacity? Um, how do we handle the tools, the work, um, the tools as limitations and the tools as opportunities? Tools, learning the tool can be really tricky. Adam was talking about in order to get his students using Twine, he had to create, or he chose to create, user guides. That must have taken a lot of time. And that was time well spent because not only are your students using it, but lots of other people are using it too. But think about that investment of time. and and how much effort that takes. Or you do a full, fully stage your timeline, your story map JS, and then something breaks at the last minute that you could, or you couldn't anticipate. And this, this happens all the time. Um, so what I've learned is it's really important to uh, manage expectations, manage my own expectations, and lower the stakes for me and for my students. So scale down the projects, maybe um, not try to do quite as much. So I found that each semester that I was teaching, I was doing smaller and smaller projects, but we were doing more depthful work, we were doing more meaningful work, because we, didn't, we weren't working with thousands of data points, we were working with 100 data points, so it became a lot more manageable. Um, most important for me was reframing assessment, not emphasizing the final product, but emphasizing the process. That helped alleviate student anxiety. It's okay if the project doesn't work. It's okay if it completely bombs. As long as you can reflect on your process, document your process, assess your process, and talk about how you might have done it differently or how you might do it differently. Um, and so by scaffolding the assignment and weighting the various pieces of the assignment in such a way, you can signal to students that it's the process that matters as much, maybe more than the product. Um, and then always asking my quest the question, am I teaching digital humanities or am I using digital humanities tools and appro approaches to teach something else? And I think that's a really important question. I talk to a lot of faculty who want to do something cool in their class, but they haven't answered that question. And it's important to ask the question of what is gained by incorporating this digital technology into the class, but also what is lost. You lost four weeks of content. So thinking about, well, am I teaching US history or am I teaching digital history or am I teaching both? I'm also really concerned about, um, and some of you might disagree with this, but um, selling DH classes as teaching real world transferable skills. And while it's true that we're teaching coding, we're teaching the use of the learning of HTML and CSS and things like that, um, saying that can pose the risk of devaluing the humanities. We are teaching transferable, real life important skills every day in every classroom on every campus. We're teaching students to think, to communicate, to make arguments, to use evidence. These are critical skills that we need for our society. It's great that we're also teaching digital, um, digital skills, but we want to really walk that fine line there. Most importantly are the ethical concerns. I've sort of hinted at a little bit of how the potential for exploitation in these classrooms, um, if you're lucky enough to have a graduate student supporting the class as may maybe a project manager to be very mindful of the workload, but also the exploitation for students, particularly students who are, if you're, it's, um, if you're bringing a research project into the classroom and giving students the opportunity to help craft that and shape it, um, making sure that we're doing that in ways that are not exploitative. Um, it's been my experience at UNC that students 
could tell very quickly when they were being exploited and would articulate that in their evaluations, which is unfortunate that they have to wait till the end of the semester to articulate that concern. I think that it can be incredibly meaningful to bring students into faculty scholarship and to merge scholarship and teaching in the classroom, but just to do that in ways that are mindful of what students are gaining. And in particular, um, making sure that it's not deficit learning for students. Students are paying for the privilege of being in our classes. And if we're just giving them credits for the work that they're doing, is that really compensation? Um, is, it just, is it enough just to have their name on the project? How can we really think about compensation in a resource scarce environment? And just because we can do a digital project in our class, should we? That's the question again. So again, I'm not trying to suggest that I have all the answers, but that I'm working towards some answers that I'm hoping that I can put into play, um, or I can share at San Diego State. Um, and one is avoiding coercion. Um, let's say you want to have your students live tweet the reading of a novel. That's an awesome activity, except that not all students want to participate in social media, even with a fake account. So you need to provide mean we need to provide meaningful alternatives for students who want to opt out of social media, for instance. So maybe they can curate the tweets of the class without having to actually sign in and engage in that environment. So we need to find ways to allow them to work without coercion. Um, again, providing proper compensation and credit um, and developing mutually agreed upon guidelines. And the UCLA has a great example with their Student Collaborators Bill of Rights, which is just an excellent resource and a great starting place. Finally, it's really important that we use DH in the classroom in ways that are meaningful. And by meaningful, I really mean transformative. Transformative not just for our students, and we've heard so many great stories today of students being transformed by the experience, but it should also be transformative for us, for our teaching, for our research and our practice, um, and that it's more than just transferable skills. Finally, for anyone thinking about it or struggling with your own DH teaching, um, and again, I'm borrowing from uh, Ryan Cordell here, start small. Don't try to do everything all at once. Don't try to overhaul a complete class. Maybe just work one module or one unit and make it digital and slowly work your way out. Again, scale down the project. Um, and if students are proposing their own projects, maybe make sure that they're not proposing more than they can do as well. It's very hard to figure out what the scale and scope of a project of a, of a project can be that can be done in a semest, uh, semester. So thinking about that, but try to integrate technologies whenever you can. Even sort of low, lower. Uh, how do you say that? Sort of less fancy, easier technologies. I don't know what the right language is there. Um, and then scaffold everything. And finally, use what you have locally. So again, I'll be trying to work on figuring out some answers to some of these questions for folks at San Diego State. And I should add that we'll be building a digital humanities space in our library in the coming year. So stay tuned. Thank you.